technology again. Here we see Mike Pig, current Coke Grand Prix leader. I want, you, I want you to look at these handlebars. Those handlebars sort of come in sort of like ski poles. He's holding on to those two poles in front. They're part of the handlebar structure. The single element that this handlebar configuration really does is body position. Notice how Mike is sloped down. He's looking forward. His hands are creating an airfoil. He's totally aerodynamic in terms of body position. Here we see Scott Molina with the identical set of handlebars. You know, there's advancements every year. And only in the last two months has, has the new hot item come out, uh, these funky handlebars that Mike Pig and I and Brad Kearns, that's another name, um, you might want to watch. Uh, there's a, there'll be a few guys out there, and, and, and all of them with those new bars, with the new stuff, will be at the front. And it's, it's, no, it's no coincidence. Hi, everybody. Ross here. And this is episode three of the Streak podcast. That clip you just heard was from the United States Triathlon Series Miami race that took place on the 3rd of May, 1987. It sets the scene for what we are going to talk about today, a piece of triathlon equipment that changed the sport 35 years ago and is still with us in transition areas today. That is the aero bar or the tri bar. I like to go on eBay and look for vintage triathlon items, mainly magazines, but also equipment. Stuff like J-discs, head disc wheels, seat shifters, tinly clothing, and even bikes, like a Dave Scott Centurion, a Peugeot triathlon, or one of the rallies, like a triathlon or a quadra. For quite a while, I was looking for a pair of Scott DH handlebars. You know, the one-piece bar that dips down to a kind of drop bar before rising back up to allow the classic tri-bar hand position. The clamp width was 26mm to fit the quill stems of the day, and the elbow pads were semi-soft moulded rubber that you had to slide down the whole length of the bar to be positioned next to the stem. For me, these bars define the aesthetics of the era when I first got involved in triathlon. I saw a pair for sale last year in the UK, I hesitated at the price, and by the time I decided to buy them, they'd been scooped up by another triathlon uber nerd. But then early in 2021, sets started popping up on the German and US eBay sites at good prices. So I bought four sets. I'm not sure how this happened, but each set I saw looked in better condition than the one I'd just bought. So now I've got 400 euros worth of bent aluminium triathlon history in my workshop. The Scott DH wasn't the first ever aero bar. In 1984, Speedplay Pedals founder Richard Byrne made a lay-down handlebar for Race Across America competitor Jim Elliott. Then in 1986, Pete Penseris won the 5,000km event on another homemade but improved set. But neither of these bars were patented or manufactured in large quantities. The Scott DH bar was. It was also definitely the first bar to achieve popularity in triathlon. The concept was developed by Boone Lennon, who was a national team ski coach based in Sun Valley, Idaho. He experimented a lot with the aerodynamics of skiing and knew the best way to cut through air. In 1986, he made a wooden prototype of the DH or downhill handlebar and gave it to contacts he had at Scott USA, also based in Sun Valley. Scott USA eventually became Scott Sports, the bike company now based in Switzerland. Scott USA was founded by Ed Scott in 1958 to make aluminium ski poles. In the 1970s, they branched out into motocross accessories. When they got their hands on Lennon's prototype, they weren't at all involved in cycling. An engineer at Scott USA called Charlie French bent the first pair of aluminium DH bars in his workshop and then used them himself to win his age group at the 1986 Hawaii Ironman. Here he is on the Scott Sports YouTube channel. Boone and I were coming back from a bike race one day and, and he said, I've got this idea for some, some handlebars. So he made this set of wooden bars and we went down south of town to um, Timmerman Hill. We rolled down Timmerman Hill side by side we got the bottom, we were dead even. Put the bars on his bike, 
rolled on again. He was about six bike lengths ahead of me. Put the bars on my bike, I was six lengths ahead of him. So that was our wind tunnel test. The first two pair that were ever used in competition, I used in the Ironman. I won my age group and set a new course record. Two or three years, the, the triathletes all used the bars. A patent was filed in January 1987 and existing handlebar companies Nitto and 3T were chosen to manufacture the bars for Scott. The June 1987 issue of Triathlete magazine said that the bars retailed for between 40 and 60 US dollars. The Race Across America crowd challenged the patent, but it was considered that their bar was made for comfort on long rides. Boone Lennon's bar was designed specifically for aerodynamics and speed. With Charlie French's interest in triathlon and his proof of concept ride in Kona, the bars would no doubt eventually hit the triathlon market. But the story of how it happened is still an iconic and interesting one. In the winter of 1986 and 1987, ambitious pro triathlete Brad Kearns had just made a breakthrough in the sport by winning the first two races in the three-race Desert Princess Biathlon Series that was organised in Palm Springs, California. The distances were 10km run, 60km bike, 10km run. With the young triathlon spin-off activity of biathlon, or duathlon as we call it now, still being very much US-centric, the Desert Princess Series was considered the de facto world championships of the sport. Here's what Triathlete magazine had to say in June 1987 when set in the scene before the third race in the series. Quote, The first two events, held in November and January, set the stage for a dramatic championship. An unknown triathlete from Woodland Hills, California, Brad Kearns, blew away the entire field of seasoned pro triathletes, including Scott Molina, at both races. His second victory over the group was by an impressive five minutes. After the race, Molina was unruffled by this new young challenger, inquiring if the 21-year-old Kearns could swim. The answer is yes, but that's another story. The biathlon had been a novelty for the Terminator, a kind of off-season fun race and potential paycheck. After the second race, he dropped from the first, and a sound beating of more than six minutes, Molina declared with a bit more fire in his voice. If this guy wins again, he'll be puking at the finish line. No more easy wins for the new kid on the block. End quote. I got in touch with Brad to talk about Desert Princess, and he was more than happy to chat about the old days. Here he is discussing the significance of those first two race wins and the reaction of Bob Babbitt, the publisher of Competitor magazine. And so uh, if you're aware, this was a three race series, right? And the first two races, I had the two best races of my life. I destroyed the field. It was a complete shock to me and everyone else. Um, I like uh, Babbitt uh, calling it the greatest upset in the history of multi-sport, which um, I, I might think that's valid because it was Scott Molina, the number one triathlete, triathlete of the year award, Kenny Souza, who had never lost a duathlon ever. And those two guys were finally pitted for a showdown. And, you know, I, I, I toasted them twice in a row. The second race, my victory margin was five minutes. So I was, you know, way out there and everyone was trying to figure out, you know, how am I going to, how's this guy going to get taken down in February? But in the final race in the series on the 28th of February, 1987, Brad was about to make history as the first professional triathlete to use a pair of aero bars in a multi-sport event. Here's how he found out about them and then how he got hold of a pair of Scott DHs and also how much experience he'd had on the bars before racing with them. Note also another Race Across America connection. Uh, I, I trained with Johnny G, who was the uh, legendary creator of spinning, fitness celebrity and uh, Race Across America finisher. And so um, he was the one that introduced me to these bars and he bugged me for probably a month straight every time we went out training he said you got to get a pair of these it's the greatest invention in the last hundred years of cycling and he was prone to hyperbole and i'm like yeah yeah whatever you know and so finally um you know i i i was given the number of boone lennon and i called him up and he um you know he showed me the picture of 
the, the comparison with the bicycle rider and the ski racer in the tuck holding the handlebars. I don't know if you can come across that picture. It was in the original flyer, but it was such a profound, yeah, incredible image where you're like, holy crap, we're slicing through the wind. No skiers do it, you know, and, and Franz Klammer stood up on the bump and then got right back into the tuck. And so that, you know, that convinced me and Boone, you know, sent me a pair. And by the time I got him on my bike, it was Friday and the race was Saturday. So I had, you know, a six mile bicycle ride through the neighborhood as my preparation before I went into the racks and, um, you know, did the world championships. I thought the sight of this secret weapon would have turned heads in transition before the race. But according to Brad, apparently not. Here's why. Well, I had a blanket over my bike before the race. So, and it was just to be funny because I think the only person that knew anything was Andrew McNaughton, my training partner. The race was won by easily the best biathlete of the 1980s, Kenny Souza, with Glenn Cook in second and Scott Molina third. Brad finished fourth, holding his position from T2 after being down in 28th place after the first run. As you probably can't race with a blanket over your bike, other competitors must have taken notice by now. I, I got off the bike in fourth, and so I passed a bunch of guys on the bike. So there was a lot of people that got to see me ride away from them in this aero position. And so you ask the question, what did they think beforehand in the racks? Probably nobody noticed. Uh, it didn't even notice my joke of a blanket. Uh, but afterward, um, there was plenty of attention. And uh, Molina was the first one to come over to uh, my condo you know, with a beer in hand after the race and the bike was sitting there and he's like, what the hell are these? You know? And I explained just as Boone Lennon explained to me about the ski racer and the tuck. For the full condo story, you need to read Brad Kern's book. Can you make a living doing that? It's a fun retelling of the ups and downs of his 10 plus years on the circuit. I'll link to it in the show notes. Just like Brad, Scott Molina was equally generous with his time and knowledge to help me get this podcast up and running. Even though Brad covered his bars with a blanket, did Scott know the bars were out there and an aerodynamic revolution was about to take place? I don't remember if I actually knew if they existed, uh, but if I did, I would have thought, uh, you know, what a ridiculous thing, you know? We had no, no, no appreciation whatsoever about what was going to happen with the aerodynamics of those bars. But during the race, he got to see them close up and post-race discussing the results with Kenny Souza, the advantage they offered was obvious. Yeah, he went past me like a rocket. Yeah, well, I, did, I, didn't, I honestly didn't appreciate it at the time until afterwards when I saw all the bike splits uh, of everybody and uh, Kenny and I got to talking. And that's when I realized, okay, this, this guy has smashed us to bits uh, with, the, with these things. And so, you know, we were, we were on the phone the next day. So the aero bars were out there, but they still hadn't been used by a pro triathlete in a triathlon, and they still hadn't won anything. But on the 11th of April, 1987, that was about to change. The fifth Crawfish Man Triathlon took place in Mandeville, Louisiana, six weeks after the third Desert Princess race. In August 1987, Triathlete Magazine published a report on the Crawfish Man race. Quote, Mike Pig, last year's co-defending champion, was the pre-race favourite. But Andrew McNaughton, a native of Montreal, Canada, who now resides in Canoga Park, California, topped the charts to surprise Pig by beating him in his strongest event, the bike. While Pig was out of the water a minute ahead of him, McNaughton used the super strange, super aerodynamic new Scott DH handlebars to great advantage, speeding to a 1.43.47 bike split, a full five minutes faster than Pig's 1.48.52. Coming out of relative obscurity to racing the Crawfish Man, McNaughton passed Pig for good at the 22-mile mark of the 45-mile bike. With Pig still close on his tail at the second turnaround on the T-shaped bike course, McNaughton blasted through a headwind to arrive at the bike run transition with a four-minute lead. Glenn Cook, one of England's top triathletes, who had led for part of the bike, 
broke a spoke in his front wheel and dropped out before the run. McNaughton ran a 1.14.49 half marathon and Pig's one minute faster run wasn't enough to close the cycling gap. I was surprised Pig didn't run me down, said McNaughton. So was Pig. After the race, he began to wonder if he'd been slipping. Maybe I've lost some of my hunger, he reflected. Later, he decided that the radical new aerodynamic handlebars used by McNaughton had a lot to do with his loss. Within a week, he had a pair of his own. End quote. Here's what Brad had to say about his training partner, Andrew McNaughton, and the importance of that bike-dominant win at Crawfish Man. Yeah, and Andrew and I were training partners from the very beginning, and he was so inspired by my victories because he considered himself to be as good or better athlete than I was, and here I was getting all this attention, and he was just some guy that got, I think he got 11th or 9th in the in the Desert Princess series, and you know he was coming along, but boy, when he came out there in April, he was in incredible shape, and he had a set of bars. And so uh, none other than Mike Pig got smoked from the turnaround back into the wind. Andrew put several minutes on Pig on the bike. And so after the race, like I wrote you, um, you know, Pig came up across the line, approached Andrew and said, where'd you get those bars before he said, congratulations on your great victory, especially knock off the guy who was the biking sensation of the sport. Cause we're coming off 1986, where I think Pig, you know, he, he literally blew up the sport because previous to that, it was a bunch of skinny guys who were great runners. They could also swim and bike and and they get off the bike and, and see who could drop the fastest 10 K. And now here's this guy that was riding so fast that he was jogging in, in 86 running, you know, an unimpressive 3506 10 K, but it didn't matter because he had a four minute lead off the bike. So everyone had to recalibrate, uh, from top to bottom to realize, Hey, this thing is a time trial and you better, you know, you better get some quads on you and, and be able to put out some Watts, but it wasn't like that before. So for the St. Anthony's triathlon in Tampa Bay on the 26th of April, 1987, Mike pig had his pair of Scott DH. He won the race with the Terminator himself, Scott Molina, also racing on the bars for the first time, finishing in second. Scott explained to me that his bars came via his wheel sponsor, Steve Head, who always seemed to be up to date with anything involving aerodynamics. On the same day as Tampa Bay, Andrew McNaughton was at it again, winning race one in the Los Angeles Triathlon Series, with Brad Kearns finishing in sixth. The week after Tampa Bay and Los Angeles, the circuit headed to Miami for the opening race of the fifth edition of the United States Triathlon Series, or USTS. Mike Pig was the defending series champion, and Scott Molina had won the final USTS race of the 1986 season at Hilton Head. Thank you through 12 cities culminating in a national championship to be held in Hilton Head, South Carolina in late September. Hello everyone, I'm John Paul Della Camera. I'm your host for this triathlon, a triathlon that will encompass some of your favorite athletes, not only from this country, but other countries as well. Some top pros are here and some top amateurs, and among the top pros, Scott Molina, a four-time winner on the Bud Light USTS circuit. There's also a perennial favorite, Scott Tindley, a newcomer from last year, Mike Pig, who really made a great debut. He won the Coke Grand Prix a year ago. On the women's side, there's the national champion from a year ago, as well as the Coke Grand Prix winner, and that's Kirsten Hansen, as well as Linda Buchanan, the triathlete, lady triathlete of the year from 1986. The Bud Light U.S. Triathlon Series combines a 1,500-meter swim, a 40-kilometer bike ride, and a 10-kilometer run. The swim this morning, 1,500 meters in Biscayne Bay, right off Bayside, out near the cruise ships, which you saw, back in onto the bikes in transition, then out on a 25-mile bike ride over the Rickenbacker Causeway, then back into downtown Miami, which you can see behind me here, the skyline. Then we go on a 10K run. That goes south from the finish line, curls back around through the Miami Grand Prix course, and finishes up right at Bicentennial Park. All told, the top men will be just under two hours, say around 155. The top women, seven or eight minutes behind them. I've linked to the full Miami race coverage in the show notes, and I'm guessing here, but this is probably the first time that aero bars were seen on TV. As well as seeing Mike Pig effortlessly cut through the field and Scott Molina run strong to finish second, you can also see that plenty of pro athletes, including Kirsten Hansen and Harold Robinson, are not on aero bars yet. 
Some were riding low profile bikes that wouldn't easily adapt to the hands forward position and some simply couldn't get hold of a set. Here's Brad again. You know, I'd bring my bike to the race and I'd be taking it to the parking lot and people would come up to me with cash offers right there on the spot. I'll give you $500 for those bars. I'll give you $250 for those bars. And, um, you know, I declined every time. I didn't think that was right with uh, the Scott sponsoring me and all that. And I don't think he could keep up at all with the production when it first came out. It was just, you know, everybody wanted a pair. Towards the end of my Zoom call with Brad, I held one of my sets of Scott DH up to the camera a silver Nitto production model from 1987 or 1988. Brad instantly noticed the difference between mine and what he was on in 1987, also explaining the low availability of the early bars. Yeah, they were handmade. I mean, the ones you showed me uh, from 87, I think those must be production because mine were clearly asymmetrical from the right side and the left side. So that's a beautiful pair right there. But whatever Boone did with the blowtorch, that's, that's what I had. And it was, yeah, a special pair. Due to the initial scarcity of the bars and the clear time advantage offered to those that had them, the national governing body of the sport in the USA, TriFed, was definitely worried about an uneven playing field being created. In September 1987, Triathlete magazine published the article No More High Tech Bikes that rumoured TriFed were considering rules that could see technologies with limited availability, like Scott DH bars, being banned, as well as a maximum bike price allowed in triathlons. Although I'm pretty sure these rule changes never happened. In 1988, Profile for Speed, now called Profile Design, released their first one-piece bar. It was called the Aero One and offered a similar hand position but with a shallower drop bar area. Another patent battle saw Profile settle out of court to produce their bars under license from Scott. Smaller brands also tried to get involved in the Aero Bar game, but Scott USA was intent on defending their patent and closed down potential rivals. Sintace and a few others also licensed Scott's idea in the 1990s. Otherwise, we had to wait until 2006 and the patent to expire before more companies could create their versions of Aero Bars. For the 1989 season, both Scott USA and Profile for Speed had clip-on models. The Scott ones were famously used by Greg LeMond in the 1989 Tour de France, and the Profile Aero 2s were the first Aero bars I ever owned, having bought them on a family holiday to Florida in July 1989. Looking through the triathlon press from 1987, 1988 and 1989, you can see that many triathletes who started out on Scott DHs eventually moved to Profile Aero 1s. In 1987, athletes didn't have the choice, but in 1988 and 1989, Profile probably had better sponsorship packages and supply lines to sell to age groupers. And although Scott released the Extreme and 100k one-piece bars and their clip-on models remained popular, by 1990, the DHs had pretty much disappeared from the sharp end of races. So the bars travelled from Sun Valley in Idaho, took a quick trip over to Kona, then to Palm Springs for the Desert Princess Biathlon, down to Louisiana for the Crawfish Man, and then all over the USTS circuit. But what about the UK? How did the bars first get there? I got my lead on this part of the story, the first person to use Scott DH bars in the UK, from an article in the 21st of January 1988 issue of Cycling Weekly. The piece is titled, Go Faster with New Radical Aero Bars. Quote, This season has seen a radical reappraisal. When Aussie Phil Gable arrived at the Jordans race, with his bike extended by what seemed to be a good six inches at the front with the Scott DH handlebars, people looked and laughed. Two hours later, when Phil had cruised past a top-class field, even without the benefit of cycling shoes or toe clips, forgotten, people looked again. The laughter was noticeable by its absence. End quote. I managed to track down Phil Gable in Australia. Like Brad and Scott, Phil was equally generous with his time. 
we ended up exchanging plenty of emails and spending an hour or more chatting about the backstory to the bars. In 1987, Phil was an ambitious triathlete already in his fifth year of racing. So at the end of January, he headed to Fremantle in Western Australia to take part in the self-titled World Sprint Triathlon Championships. The race was a big deal, with the biggest ever prize purse in the sport and pretty much all the best triathletes in attendance. I mentioned it in episode one, and I've got a full podcast about the event planned for the future. Phil finished 20th in Fremantle after coming off the bike in 6th and in the main pack, but the performance gave him the idea that he could compete well out of Australia in some of the biggest races on the international calendar. So sometime in the spring, he quit his physiotherapy job in Adelaide on a Friday and by Monday was on a plane to San Diego. To live the late 80s triathlon dream, to do the Tuesday run and the Wednesday ride, to race the USTS series and to maybe hang out with people who held a similar interest in a new and fledgling sport. In San Diego, he ended up lodging with local journeyman pro triathlete and bike shop owner Mark Montgomery. It was on a training ride with Mark one day when a pair of cyclists bolted past them. Phil and Mark chased and caught up to the two cyclists, basically just to find out how they were going so fast and why they looked so slick and streamlined. The answer was that they were both bent over on Scott DH's. It was Boone Lennon and Andrew McNaughton. Here's Phil. Mark and I were cycling one day on Highway 101, I'm pretty sure, um, don't know why it might have been been coming back from the Tuesday morning ride or something. I have no idea why we're on highway 101 and these two guys um, literally just barrel past us. And um, we kind of stared at each other and went, you know, what was that? Um, It was kind of funny at the time. And so we thought, Oh, well, let's, let's catch up to them, which was lucky at the time because uh, (laughs) I think they'll go a little slower than normal. Anyway, we caught up to them and they're just two really, really nice guys having a chat. And Boone was really quite talkative. Uh, and Mark is really talkative. And I guess we exchanged phone numbers or whatever, had a quick talk about what was happening, what they were, um, tried to get our heads together on what we were looking at and uh, pretty much parted on our own ways. And Mike, Mark was opening owning a bike shop at the time and he was particularly interested in getting the bars in as a uh, sales item. And I was only a couple of weeks later about to head off um, west, um, sorry, east to um, go to uh, Houston, USTS and a few other events. So I had the um, bars forwarded to me to a uh, friend's place in Santa Clara and I picked them up there and put them on and then caught the plane from Santa Clara to Houston. I'm pretty sure I used them in Houston. I can't actually remember. Phil raced three times in the USA, including Wildflower and USTS Houston. But deciding that pursuing the USTS was not for him, he headed to Europe with his new handlebars bolted onto his low pro Barretto and plans to follow the Aussie tradition of a working holiday in the old country, but maybe with a few triathlons thrown in. He'd met Glenn Cook and Sarah Coop during his travels, and Sarah had given him the phone number and address of a friend of hers in France. So his ultimate destination was Paris, to look up Sarah's friend, Kevin O'Neill, a British pioneer on the French triathlon circuit, and hopefully to negotiate a place on Kevin's team, Poissy Triathlon. But before making his way to Paris, Phil stopped in the UK to stay with an old university friend in Manchester. While in the northeast, he debuted the bars discreetly at a couple of Manchester Wheelers midweek time trials and at the Mansfield Triathlon on the 40-kilometre bike that followed the pool swim. But it was after his win, ahead of a surprise Mike Harris, at round two of the Lecoq Sportif Grand Prix, hosted by the Jordans Triathlon in Bedford, that the triathletes took notice. He also won round three at Barry Island. Um, and Jordan's was my first um, exposure to the UK big time. Um, and, the, yeah, the gun went off and then I never saw anybody. Um, <laughs> um, excepting um, I met what I gather was Mike Harris at the end who was saying, you know, what are those things on the front of your bike? Um, and then the other thing he was always asking was, um, how come you guys don't ride with bike shoes? Yeah, that's right. Phil had forgotten his cycling shoes and did the whole bike ride in his running shoes. 
He eventually found them in his van after the race. Phil's trip to France also ended up being a successful one. He got that place at Poissy and became the first Australian to race regularly on the French circuit. I think that's also a story for a future episode. Back in the UK, sometime in 1987, bicycle component distributor Freewheel supplied their sponsored athletes Mike Harris and Sarah Springman. Then in the March and April 1988 issue of Triathlete UK, the bars were officially announced to the UK triathlon public. Quote, You've seen them in pictures. You've seen them at the events. Now you can finally try them for yourself. The Scott DH brackets downhill handlebars have arrived on our shores and are set to sell like hotcakes. End quote. Official vendors were named as Bert Harkins Racing in Berkhamsted, RJ Chicken in Dunstable and Karate Sport in Bath. The retail price was £48. So, what am I going to do with my bars? At the moment, just look at them and think about the good old days. But then, I'm going to start to build a period correct 1987 or 1988 triathlon bike to use at a few local races. My brother will also take one set. He's a big handlebar geek and has several other vintage models in his garage. I'll record an episode with him soon so he can take us through his tri-bar collection. Interestingly, he has some MB bars, another one-piece handlebar from the 1980s. The shape retains the full drop bar characteristics before the aluminium rises up and forward about 15 centimetres apart, parallel to the stem. I recently chatted on Facebook with the bar's inventor, I really want to record something with him. There's a great backstory there, including being beaten to a large manufacturing contract by Scott and the possibility that both the MBs and DHs were being developed separately but at the same time on different sides of the Atlantic. Glenn Cook also posted on his Instagram account in February 2021 that he had the first pair of Scott DH bars in Europe. In fact, he was racing them even before Phil Gable triggered the Cycling Weekly article by getting aero at the Jordans Triathlon on the 21st of June 1987. I haven't been able to contact Glenn for confirmation, but I believe he first used them at the Avignon Triathlon on the 7th of June, where he finished second to Mark Allen. I've put a picture from this race in the show notes. It was published in the July 1987 issue of Triathlete France. I've also included a picture of Phil Gable. I couldn't find one from Jordan's, so instead it's a picture taken five weeks later at the Canterbury Triathlon. Like Phil Gable's bars, Glenn's pair of Scott DHs were sourced in California on a training camp in the spring of 1987. And although Glenn opened his 1987 season at Les Mureaux near Paris on the 8th of May and also raced the European Short Course Championships in Marseille on the 31st of May, I'm pretty sure he didn't use the DHs at these races. At least, it's not mentioned in the race reports and I think the bars would have turned heads. Show notes for this episode can be found at thestreakpodcast.com forward slash podcast forward slash three. Thanks again to Brad Kearns, Scott Molina and Phil Gable for your enthusiasm for the project. And as always, if you've got a question, a correction, some extra historical information or just want to say hi, you can email me at thestreakpodcast at gmail.com. I'll leave you with a clip from the USTS Championship race at Hilton Head, South Carolina, that took place on the 27th of September 1987, and they're still talking about Scott D.H. Bars. On the narrow road leading to Highway 278, Brooks Clark settles first into a rhythm and flies past Mackle. Then Mackle 2 is set and begins to hammer away, making up the lost ground. The strange handlebars are the latest in aerodynamic technology. They force the riders into a sleek, compact, downhill ski racing position and are said to make the better riders a minute or more faster, over 25 miles. Like the wetsuits, they are indispensable. All the top athletes must use them or be left behind. 
driving hard, Knuckle flies back into first place. He drops Clark like a stone. He is strong and 10, 15 pounds heavier than the other top men, so the flat hill head bike course will play to his advantage. Knuckle has been a journeyman pro all year long, leading in the swim, setting the pace on the bike in the early stages, then fading to the rear. But he's been holding on longer and longer in the late season, and today he wears a look of confidence and grim purpose. He won't give the lead away, that's for sure. Someone is going to have to take it.